you. Hi, everyone, and thanks uh, you very much for inviting me in this very nice event. And um, yeah, let me share the slides. Um, Is it okay? Can you see the slides? Can you hear yeah. me? We can see, we can see. Okay, okay, so thank you again. So uh, the title of the presentation, as you can see, is Inequality and Monetary Policy with ABM. And um, yes, I I have now a position at the Universitat Jaume Primer in Spain, and I'm also associate professor of economics at the Polytechnic University of Marc in Ancona, Italy. Um, let's start with a short introduction about inequality and uh, monetary policy. And the first thing to say is that the literature on inequality and monetary policy has most focused on how monetary policy affects income and wealth distribution, or on how inequality affects the transmission mechanism of monetary policy. So. The, the majority of papers um, analyze this kind of relationship from monetary policy to inequality. In what in, in, in the paper I'm going to present, we aim at investigating the other way around. So how inequality, in particular, how growing inequality may constrain the conduct of monetary policy, in particular in a financialized economy. So in other words, we try to answer a question that, yeah, it's a con uh, yes, a question which is in, uh, uh, present in a paper by Fiducia Stiglitz, 2009. So the question is, can monetary policy become endogenous to income and wealth inequality? Okay, so and uh, so becoming a constraint for the conduct of monetary policy. So in particular, we want to study the macroeconomic implications of income inequality in a modern and uh, uh, financialized economy, and to provide insights for the conduct of monetary policy in a high and rising inequality environment. Um, what kind of model? So let's start from this kind of question. Um, during the last two decades, at least, there has been a a strong growth of papers um, applying the agent based modeling approach to macroeconomic issues. But you know that there are applications of ABM in uh, a variety of topics in economics, but also in other disciplines. Okay. So, but now we have a variety of macroeconomic agent based models from simple ones to quite large scale multi-country models. So in general, this approach can represent an alternative to the more standard approach based on DSG models and for both policy analysis and forecasting, in my view. Now, why for large scale calibrated models could be required? Um, so, so why for forecasting? Uh, in a sort of large scale calibrated models could be required. For example, uh, there is a very nice paper published very recently in uh, the European Economic Review by Poldna and Kodors, uh, in which they replicate the um, Austrian economy with an Asian based model and some econometric techniques, and uh, they they are able to forecast this economy and according to the results better than a standard DSG model. So uh, there is an advancement, very interesting advancement in this kind of approach regarding also forecasting. But I think that still small scale models can be very useful for reproducing relevant socialized facts and for policy analysis. And uh, in this presentation, I'm going to present a, a paper. Now there is a working paper available entitled Inequality Constrained Monetary Policy in a Financialized Economy uh, with my co-authors, Luca Eduardo Fierro and uh, Federico Giri. Basically, we propose a minimal macroeconomic model, agent-based model, to study how income inequality affects monetary policy under financial liberalization. Okay. 
Why using an agent-based model? Um, first of all, because ABM allows for modeling the interaction of heterogeneous agents. Uh, in our case, in the case of this paper, households in particular. And the second point is that agent-based modeling is a flexible methodology allowing us to introduce more realistic assumptions, like, for example, bounded rationality, a la Herbert Simon, as mentioned by Anarita. Second, second, direct interaction, not just indirect interaction, interaction through the price system, but also direct interaction. In the case of our paper, imitation in consumption, for example. And uh, a third point, uh, um, is that we make use of the endogenous money theory instead of the more traditional, the, the mainstream uh, theory based on loanable funds. Okay, so this is a very central assumption in, in the paper to decouple the accumulation of saving on the part of the rich households from the accumulation of debt by middle to low income classes. So we will see uh better this point uh lastly uh the simplicity of our minimal in a sense macro model allows us to neatly describe the mechanisms of the model leading to the simulation results so we moreover we don't have stochastic factors so in this case i think that there is no no room for a sort of black box critics to an agent based model no because yeah, when you have a very large scale agent based model, it's possible that not all the mechanisms are very clear to the reader. But in our case, we think that the model is quite simple to be understood by uh, all the people uh, reading the paper. So at least this is our purpose. Also, the purpose is also uh, trying to uh, interact with people outside the agent-based modeling approach, okay, given, given the simplicity of the macro framework proposed in the paper. Uh, some aspects which are central for our analysis. Uh, the data are US data, basically from the FRED database. Here you can see from uh, uh, the 1980s to um, recent years, you can see the evolution of both household debt to income ratio in red and the top 10% income share. Okay, and you can see that there is a co movement. So there is the same tendency, increasing tendency as time elapses. Okay, so, and this is quite known now after a lot of papers, books, Piketty, and, uh, and you know. Um, other important relevancy less facts and the first one you can see the non-performing loan in uh, the blue line and uh, also the policy rate the fed funds and uh, also in this case you can see a similar tendency decreasing tendency at least before the global financial crisis and the great recession okay so um and uh, uh, on in the in, in the other plot, you can see again a decreasing tendency of two um, of the two plots, the two figures. One is the inflation rate, and the other one is the interest rate on personal loans, so the loans to households. Basically. And uh, um, this is just to start with uh, uh, an empirical framework. Okay, so. Also, also another another one is for example uh, uh the, the the decrease of the wage share in the in the same period this is another quite well known slides fact let's start with uh, some reference to the mainstream literature for example this paper by kumov and quarters published in 2015 in the american economic review in which you have two income classes basically the rich and the pool, so the top five, 10%, and the others, in which uh, the rich basically is a patient agent and the poor is an impatient agent. 
and and in the paper you have heterogeneous saving for the two classes so they apply a permanent shocks uh, on the income shares of the two groups in order to generate more inequality and then there is more household debt accumulating after after this uh, shock okay so basically they demonstrate that more credit can sustain the economic activity but at the cost of less stability okay and we have a similar paper in the, in the journal of evolution economics uh, with an agent based model uh, with similar results um another um reference paper for us is this one by Mian Straub and Sufi published very recently in the quarterly journal of economics the, the main assumption is that there is a loanable funds theory so the, the idea is that if there is more saving then there is more household debt then they have non homothetic preferences or well so again heterogeneous propensity to consume and save and uh, the main economic implications are that the redistribution from poor to rich households results in a positive credit supply shock, okay? So more availability of credit for, for the middle class, for the poor. And the sequence of events is that there is an inequality shock, then there is more household debt, and then given the loanable fund theory, there is a decrease of the natural rate of interest. So, the, the, the interpretation by Mian Sarab Sufi is that given the decrease of the natural rate of interest uh, in this paper, in this theory, loanable fund theory, then the central bank adapts the policy rate to the tendency, to the decreasing tendency of the natural rate of interest. Okay, so basically, according to this um, uh, New York Times. Um, journalists, I don't remember the name, but there's a re reference here. So basically, central bankers in this story are the equivalent of drivers on a highway who must adapt their speed to road conditions. So the central banker is following the tendency of the natural, of the natural rate of interest. But there are other approaches, other theoretical approaches in order to explain this kind of uh, uh, size effects. For example, um, the idea, uh, in this case, a paper by Till Van Trek, the idea that inequality caused the financial crisis. So the financial crisis was rooted in the, in the, the increasing inequality. It, it's similar uh, arguments you can find in uh, the famous book by Rajan, Fault Lines, in which this increasing inequality introduce some pressure for redistribution for um, not not for redistribution sorry some pressure for solving the problems caused by increasing inequality and so the tendency to deregulate finance so more finance for uh, counteracting uh, the uh, effects of increasing inequality but we can go back for example to Deuce Berry and this famous book on income saving and the theory of consumer behavior, in which you have a, a consumer theory based on the so the so-called ratchet effect. So basically, there, there is room for imitation, for sort of habit formation in consumption. And also we can go back to Marx in wage, labor, and capital, in, in, in which he said that our wants and pleasures have their origin in society. So basically, they are of social nature. So they are of a relative nature. So there are there are motivation for imitation patterns, and uh, our contribution try to integrate different literature, different uh, um, approaches, and uh, it is based on three main pillars. So the first one is that we interpret rising income inequality as a credit demand shock trigger so why the behavioral rationale for this is um is immediate consumption huh? so related to the theories i briefly described so immediate consumption consumption norms uh, consumption cascades 
uh, which uh, there are many examples in the literature about this kind of uh, imitative uh, consumption patterns. So basically, the more unequal the, the, the income distribution is, the more misaligned once the resources became, especially for those falling below the topping distribution. So that's the point. And that in a financialized economy, more credit, the credit availability allows to close the gap between desired and affordable consumption. This is the first pillar. The second pillar of our analysis is financial liberalization. No? So, uh, because more finance can, uh, can uh, um, result in a credit bubble. And you know that from the 1970s and 80s, uh, uh, starting from the US and the UK, there was this kind of pattern of financial liberalization, so financial deregulation. So a more active uh, uh, central bank, in particular the Fed, no? providing a steady flow of liquidity to face the frequent emergencies erupting in financial markets. According to Marcello De Cecco, in a sense, the lender of last resort has been transformed in a lender of first resort. So very active financing of a fragile financial system. And in, in this framework, there is an incentive to create complex financial products um, demanded by rich households. And the raw material, the raw material for producing more financial high remuneration products is the production of more mortgages, more credit to more loans to uh, households, in particular middle class and uh, um, poor income classes. The third pillar is how inequality constrains the central bank, which is the main focus of the paper. We identify two channels. The first one, since rich households have larger saving rates with respect to the poor, and this is very well known based on empirical data, but also on the theoretical uh, post keynesian theory, for example, Caldor. So in this case, there is a shift of income from poorer to richer households. And this result in a lack of aggregate demand, so less consumption. And this lack of aggregate de demand introduced in the system a deflationary tendency, okay? So this is the first motivation for a decrease of the policy rate, so a constraint to central uh, bank decisions. Then, given that after more inequality, we have also more finance and more, more finance is functional to uh, managing a system in which there is a growing inequality. So the growth of households debt to income ratio forces the central bank to take one of the following choices, okay? In a, in a commodative uh, behavior, so basically reducing the policy rate, okay, to sustain uh, the economy, or the opposite is a leaning against the wind regime. So increase the policy rate in order to, um, in order to um, decelerate the accumulation of debt and so reduce financial fragility. So these are two very different approaches of central banking in a high inequality and financialized framework. Okay. So then we have a baseline scenario in which there is in inaction with respect to this uh, problem, okay? Um, so we designed this minimal macro agent based model and now with a large number of heterogeneous households, the other sectors are aggregate. So uh, in, in a sense, it is a hybrid agent based model. The key assumptions are in our model are heterogeneous saving rates across households belonging to different income classes and immediate consumption. So sort of keeping up with the Jones's mechanism or if you want a spending with cascades. Um, the model setup, so we have heterogeneous households that we have a non-financial firm, uh, a commercial bank and the policy institutions. So the government and central bank. Three types of markets, the goods market, the labor market, and credit market. And then it's very important, the monetary policy rule. So in the business scenario, we have a single mandate Taylor rule aimed at inflation stabilization. 
the sequence we went to give more details on, on, on the model. So firstly, uh, there is the interest payments and dividend distribution. Then the firm's expected production uh, based on adaptive uh, demand expectations. Consider that production is based only on labor as input with, with a very simple linear technology. Then there is a labor demand on the part of the public sector and the non-financial firm. And uh, uh, we determine the unemployment rate and then some randomly selected unemployment uh, uh, workers. Okay. Uh, there is, in order to simplify the framework, there is an exogenous log normally distributed shares of total wage bill, okay, which is determined initially and then keep constant. So the individual wage quota of each worker is given by this exogenous distribution. Okay, so we determine the uh, total wage bill at the aggregate level and then distribute the total wage bill according to this distribution. Okay, there is no variation a long time of this kind of uh, uh, inter individual distribution of wages. Then wage inflation is inversely related to an employment rate, according to a sort of Philip curve. Desired consumption is set uh, basically based on two parts, normal consumption, which depends on disposable income and the wealth of uh, households, and there is then an imitation component, okay, in which each household in a decile of the income distribution imitate the average behavior of households in the um, in the in the in the decile um, in the higher decile in the distribution okay so no imitation for the very rich you know in the top decile of the distribution then with the credit market households has credit in order to cover the difference between desired consumption and available resources the bank assesses uh, credit worthiness uh, for each credit application. Okay. Then the interest rate on households loan depends on the policy rate plus a spread, which is sort of risk premium on loan disposable income ratio. The government purchases are tried to pass aggregate demand, super simple. Aggregate demand is given by private consumption plus government purchases. The price is set uh, as a markup over production and financial costs. Then households pay taxes on wages, while firm and bank pay taxes on positive profits. Bank may suffer from bad loans, so non-performing loans, uh, due to household defaults on, uh, on the debt. Profits are distributed to households proportionally to their wealth, and the bank's payout policy depends on capitalization, so um, yeah, uh, and uh, respecting the car in the, this kind of financial regulation present in the, in the model. Then we can compute the public debt and the, and the public deficit and the public debt. The commercial bank buys part of issued bonds. The remaining part is uh, bought by the central bank. And then finally, the central bank sets the policy rate. We impose in this scenario two types of shocks, an inequality shock and a financial liberalization shock. The inequality shock is a positive shock on the markup. Okay, so there is a change in the functional distribution affecting the individual distribution, the interpersonal one. Because why? Because um, because dividends are distributed according to the to the relative wealth of households. So given that uh, the rich have more wealth, then they get more dividends. So a shock on the on the way on the markup have has consequences also for the interpersonal distribution. So for both for the functional and the personal distribution of income. Then there is also a financial liberalization shock, which is a positive shock on the maximum principal payment to income ratio allowed to households. This is used when the bank has to check the financial conditions of potential clients in, in uh, uh, providing uh, uh, loans, okay? More specifically, we, imp we impose a series of continuous shocks starting from period uh, 500 in the simulation. So before the markup, for example, or theta, so the two parameters are fixed, then there is these continuous shocks applied 
to these two uh, parameters, okay? Up to a maximum value. These are the simulation results in the baseline scenario. So when we apply the shock, so I consider that in these plots, uh, the numbers are, uh, um, are, start, are uh, normalized to the, to the value uh, just before, uh, just before the, um, the time when the shock is applied. Okay, so they are normalized. You can see that after the shocks, the joint uh, shock to the economy, there is an increase in inequality. So the top 10% income share, there is, um, there is less credit rationing. Okay, so more availability of credit given the financial liberalization shock. No, these are the direct consequences of the inequality shock in here and of the uh, lib financial liberalization shock in the second plot, right? Um, then there is an increase in the household's debt to income ratio, okay? Given more credit availability, more credit demand can be, um, more credit can be provided to households, and then there is more, more, um, more finance present in the economy and more financial fragility. Um, we will see why. And given the increase in inequality, there is also an increase in the unemployment. And this is the one of the, the, the main macroeconomic consequences because more inequality means a redistribution of income from the poor to the rich. So given the heterogeneous saving, um, heterogeneous consumption rates or saving rates, if you want, there is less consumption, so a lack of uh, aggregate demand, and so more unemployment. Um, given the inverse relationship between unemployment and inflation, there is also a decrease in inflation. And then, given the single mandate for the central bank in the baseline, there is also a decrease of the, po of the policy rate. Um, there is also a decrease in the interest on uh, uh, household uh, loans to households, you can see here um, a different behavior in the first part because in this case there is um, a prevalence of the effect of more households debt to income ratios but then in the second part there is a prevalence of the decrease of the policy rate huh? okay I influencing these the shape of this uh, variable and there is also a decrease of the saving rate given this kind of shocks so we are able to qualitatively uh, match a, a list of side effects. So increase in household debt to income ratio, inflation slowdown, the decrease of the policy rate, the decrease of the interest rate, and in particular, a reduction in non-performing loans, a reduction in the saving rate, and the stable saving rate of the top 10%. This is new to the literature because, for example, uh, Mian, Sufi, Mian Straub and Sufi, they are not able to reproduce this kind of side effects. Why? Because they have this kind of loanable funds theory, uh, the neoclassical approach for this kind of uh, uh, stuff. Instead, in this agent-based uh, modeling framework, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, given endogenous money in this framework, we are able to separate the accumulation of saving after more inequality uh, on, on, a, on the part of the rich and the accumulation of more, de more debt on the, for the poor, middle class and the poor classes. Okay, so this is very, very important. There is not the need. So for, for having more credit for the poor, it's not necessary to have more saving on the part of the, of the rich. That's the point. And the, 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 the importance of having a more realistic uh, monetary theory based on endogenous money. Then we extend the Taylor rule, so a sort of amended or, uh, um, yes, modified Taylor rule, adding a term regarding uh, uh, financial stability, if you want. So this is the ratio between the total household debt and the total household income, okay? And so according to this parameter beta, 
we can have the baseline scenario so in action with respect to household debt on the part of the central bank or you can have an accommodative regime with beta equal minus one or a leaning against the wind regime in, in the case in which beta is equal to one okay um the, the result is this one so as for the policy rate oh sorry as for the policy rate is clear this is the baseline scenario as before you can see that in the case of the leaning against the wind uh, approach we have an increase in the interest rate with some consequences we will see in a while in the other case we have an accommodative regime and the policy rate after a decrease is going towards sort of uh, uh, zero lower bound okay so, so trying to accommodate the financial tendency and the and the and the inequality framework uh, represented in this in this economy um so in these different scenarios with respect to the, the red one is always the baseline scenario okay so um, and surprisingly, in the case of the leaning against the wind uh, uh, strategy, we have uh, more credit rationing with respect to the baseline. Instead, we have less, considerably less credit rationing in the case of the accommodative regime. Then we have more household debt with the accommodation and less household debt with uh, leaning against the wind, more unemployment and less with leaning against the wind and less with uh, for, uh, with the degrees of the policy rate and uh, um, the non-performing loan is a little bit lower in the case of the leaning against the wind uh, strategy and which is in line with this idea because the central bank is, try is trying to reduce financial fragility the financial stability tied also to non-performing loans instead in the case of the uh, accommodative regime there is an increase of non-performing loans with respect to the baseline. So basically, in the in the case of the accommodative regime, we have more aggregate demand, more employment, so less unemployment, but at the cost of a more leveraged economy, so a more financially unstable economy. Okay, so that's the point. And we think that qualitatively, this represents the choice uh, by the Fed during the great moderation. So before the global financial crisis, if you want this, the, 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 the so-called Greenspan put, okay? So trying to accommodate a system characterized by both increasing inequality and expanding finance. At the opposite, with leaning against the wind, you can reduce financial instability. So you can have um, a more stable financial system, but at the cost of more unemployment. That's the trade-off, basically. So to uh, summarize, um, the results are that increasing inequality and the spanking finance may induce a tendency of the policy rate to decrease. So the expansion of finance may temporarily mitigate the deflationary pressure due to high rate inequality, though debt accumulation makes the system more and more financially fragile. Basically, we can have this uh, situation in which increasing inequality may constrain the conduct of monetary policy when increasing inequality meets financial liberalization now there are some limitations or more or a lot of limitations if you want but mainly a question could be too much reliance on consumption limitation has a mechanism central to uh to to to, to, to the model another point is the lack of financial assets and housing which are very central to this story but to, our idea is trying to reproduce this kind of dynamics without complicated the model very much so the, the choice was leaving outside for at least for the moment financial assets asset pricing and housing which is very central to this financial crisis story and uh, 
there is a lack of empirical investigation of the dominant policy regime. So we are working also on another paper, empirical paper, in order to understand, basically with this VAR approach, we, we, if there is this kind of uh, constraint of inequality on the conduct of uh, monetary policy. And also we are thinking about extending the model to include the housing market, asset pricing, so equities and, and so, in order to study the relation among inequality, housing boom, and financial fragility. So that's all. I try to be quite uh, short in explaining this, uh, um, this complex issue, if you want, but based using a relatively simple agent-based model. So thank you very much for your attention.